It's the most infamous paradox in all of logic. The paradox of the liar, or the self-referential statement which asserts its own falsehood. To most, this paradox is a clever but ultimately empty sophistry, lacking in any real content or significance. But few are aware how deeply this paradox lies at the heart of a number of famous incompleteness theorems that have emerged out of mathematics and logic over the last century. Indeed, is this paradox actually much stronger than most people think? Or is the liar still playing us all for a fool? This is Dialect with The Strengthened Liar and Paradoxes of Incompleteness. For a minute, let's compare and contrast two similar sentences. One, this statement is untrue. And two, this statement is unprovable. Now, but for a single word, these two sentences are exactly alike. And indeed, they both appear to contain similar paradoxical head-scratching implications. Most of us are familiar with the first one, which is commonly known as the liar's paradox. And we don't think it's a stretch to say that, if asked, the average person isn't likely to say that this statement carries any real significance. The paradox is clever and fun, perhaps. But ultimately, common sense tells us it's just a silly self-referential play on words. The second sentence, on the other hand, is widely regarded as anything but trivial. It is, in fact, responsible for a multitude of sensational-sounding theorems that have come out of mathematics, logic, and computability over the last century. The results of these theorems, the most famous of which are Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Tarski's undefinability theorem, and Turing's halting problem, purportedly tell us that we can never have a complete system of mathematics, formal logic, or computability, respectively. That is, that there will always be statements that are true within these systems, but not provable. Now, popular science loves to take these theorems and run wild with them. One need only glance at highly successful YouTube titles like these to see what sort of conclusions the theorems can inspire. Additionally, you can find the idea of incompleteness being used to explain mysteries as far-ranging as the nature of consciousness, quantum physics, free will, or even life itself, sometimes to pull its surprise-winning effect. While those who have studied the subject are generally quick to assure you that incompleteness doesn't mean all that, what exactly it does mean is also something they typically have difficulty expressing. And usually you'll get a regurgitation of the aforementioned statement. That is, that there are additional true statements in the system that are not provable. But does that statement in itself actually mean anything at all? Often when confronted with dubious interpretations of an esoteric work, it's best to go to the very source itself. In this case, we may not yet possess the tools to tackle Gödel's proof head-on, but we can make a number of strong inferences based on an informal summary Gödel himself provides us with in the opening passages of his work. Here indeed, Gödel tells us that his theorem has a close relationship to the liar's paradox. But what does that mean? Well, in the next few lines, Gödel writes that, as a result of his formal constructions, we are confronted with a proposition that asserts its own unprovability. So when he says his theorem and the liar paradox are closely related, he's indicating that they're literally the same thing, but with the word untrue swapped for unprovable. Of course, in order to build this liar statement in formal terms, Gödel's proof utilizes a ton of impressive machinery. Gödel numbering, diagonalization, and all that. But as Gödel writes in the closing lines of his introduction, it's the liar statement itself, 
and the contradiction that it furnishes that allows him to reach his famous conclusion regarding the existence of undecidable statements in mathematics. Now, the meaning of a sentence doesn't change simply because one chooses to express it in French rather than in English. Similarly, it should be clear that the significance of a sentence like this statement is unprovable shouldn't change simply because we choose to express it via a very carefully constructed mathematical language rather than in colloquial speak. But this naturally begs the question, if common sense tells us the liar's paradox isn't anything significant in everyday language, why the heck does it suddenly become so significant when it's translated into a mathematical, computable, or logical language? Indeed, there seem to be several routes to answering this question, depending on one's belief about what Gödel's proof actually signifies. The first route is to assert a significance in the distinction between the everyday notion of truth versus the mathematical notion of provability. To us, such a distinction is superficial and doesn't hold up to deeper analysis. But regardless, one can easily recast the liar's paradox in terms that don't invoke the concept of true and false, such as with the Nelson-Grelling paradox or the Barber paradox indicating we can't attribute the significance of incompleteness solely to the distinction between true and provable. Another route to take is via historical context, wherein we recognize that Gödel's incompleteness theorem was a reaction to the Hilbert program of the early 20th century, a program which basically treated math like a religion and assumed that all mathematical truths could be constructed out of a few simple ones. By showing that an absurd self-referential statement could be constructed in almost solely mathematical terms, one could argue that Gödel was cleverly demonstrating that mathematics was merely a language like any other, and therefore subject to all of its usual foibles. But this answer overlooks one crucial and hugely problematical point. In order to believe in the results of Gödel's theorem, that is, in order to be able to conclude that mathematics is incomplete, we have to first believe that the sentence, this statement is unprovable, is truly paradoxical, and not simply a gibberish nonsensical statement disguised as a well-formed one. Which means the validity of every incompleteness theorem boils down to whether or not you believe the sentence, this statement is unprovable, is truly a valid paradox. The renowned logician Alfred Tarski understood this quite straightforwardly, and his conclusion was that this meant that the liar's paradox was something extremely significant. To depreciate the importance of this and other antinomies, he wrote in his works, and to treat them as jokes or sophistries, would be quite wrong and dangerous from the standpoint of scientific progress. Of course, since his own cherished undefinability theorem hinges on the liar's paradox, it's hard not to read a certain measure of bias in this statement. Moreover, he never qualifies it with any explanation of specifically why or how failing to take the liar's paradox seriously would present such a danger to science. Indeed, you'd be hard-pressed to say that the average person would adopt a stance such as Tarski's. Since no empirical content could ever be found within a sentence such as, this statement is false, our ordinary intuition tends to reject it as a case of trivial semantics. But if we reject our everyday notion of the liar's paradox, then we must reject any notion of the liar statement, regardless of how formally or intelligently it may be codified. This would, of course, render the liar statements as constructed by Gödel Turing, and Tarski to be nothing more than cases of trivial semantics, from which no real deductions or conclusions could ever be drawn. To attempt to rescue the significance of self-referential liar statements, we can, however, take refuge in what's known as the strengthened liar, sometimes also called the liar's revenge. 
What is the strengthened liar? Well, as opposed to a sentence that goes, this statement is false, the strengthened liar instead reads, this statement is not true. It's an ever so slight difference in semantic construction, small enough at first glance as to seem entirely pointless. But it's actually intended to incorporate the neither true nor false resolutions that are typically offered up in response to the liar's paradox. That is, when we are confronted with the statement, this statement is false, we can't navigate our way to a resolution unless we claim that the notion of true or false can't be applied to it, and that rather some third intermediate value should be assigned as the paradox's outcome, for example, indeterminate, meaningless, undecidable, etc. But with this statement is not true, the category not true now encompasses the possibility that this statement, if not false, can instead be indeterminate or whatever third value we've chosen to assign to it. Thus, if we repeat the paradox, we'll see that while interpreting the statement as false still produces a contradiction, interpreting the statement as true doesn't lead to the implication that the statement must be false. Rather, the statement can still be our third indeterminate value, meaning no contradiction results and there is no paradox. Thus, when we construct the strengthened liar, we are in essence building a solution to the traditional liar paradox that asserts, this statement is not true, is true, because it is indeterminate. In essence, we've discovered a truth that lies outside the domain of empirical content. But of course, this is a completely trivial truth, since all it says is that we have a gibberish, meaningless statement before us. Now, swap this statement is not true for this statement is not provable, and we can repeat the strengthened liar argument to reach a conclusion that goes, this statement is not provable is true because it is indeterminate. Therefore, we have shown that there are statements within our system of reasoning which are true but not provable. In other words, We've just recreated the only precise meaning one can give to the incompleteness theorems. But of course, we see this is only because those statements which are true but not provable are in fact only statements about the meaninglessness of other statements. Which brings us in all likelihood to what Gödel's and the other incompleteness theorems are truly about finding ways to construct undefined or underdefined statements that have the appearance of being well-defined, and then applying the strengthened liar to them in order to deduce a truth that doesn't arise from the axioms, namely that those statements are undefined. But wait, you might object, isn't all the rigor and structure of Gödel's proof exactly meant to prevent one from coming up with an undefined or underdefined statement in the first place? Well, that's the million dollar question. One possible answer is no, not necessarily. Gödel, Tarski, and others were partially concerned with giving classification to the relative strengths of formal languages and when and how they would or wouldn't lead to paradoxical self-referential statements. So their proofs could mean that at a certain level of logical language adoption, you're always going to be able to sneak in undefined concepts into your structure. Or there's the chance that Gödel's construction itself is flawed. Many have suggested this possibility over the decades, and indeed, the theorem's close resemblance to another paradox known as Richard's paradox suggests this may well be the case, as Richard's paradox itself was said by its own inventor not to be a valid or well-defined one. But all of this, of course, requires much more investigation, so we'll be following up with it in future videos. In the meantime, we want to know your thoughts on incompleteness. Do you truly believe these theorems to be immensely profound statements about our reality, or are they a case of overinflating something that is utterly trivial? No one but you can ultimately form that opinion.
so think on it carefully. This has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.